Hey, I'm, I'm Ed Conzell. Uh, I work in the uh, cloud and managed services group here at Cisco, working uh, with the service providers to dealing with the OpenStack and uh, different uh, you know, cloud models uh, for deployment. Uh, first off, I don't want to disappoint you too much because I'm not a developer, but I've, uh, I came from a product manager background, so developers are my best friends when you're developing applications. And what we're going to talk about is I'm not going to tell you how to develop enterprise applications, but I'm going to kind of give you a kind of a different way to think about them uh, when you know, you're, you know you work with your product managers and they give you some of the what to do. You guys figure out the how, and together you just, you know I'm going to give you some some kind of the ideas to think about it differently than you, ha you have in the past. So, all right. So we're going to talk about some. I'm going to talk about some enterprise applications. I'm going to talk, I'm going to take this the, this idea of enterprise applications and and spin it into a hybrid dis discussion, which is kind of different than you might expect. And then I'm going to talk about Project Shift. I don't know if any, any of you guys uh, went to any of the theater sessions with the the Project Shift. Um, talk about microservices and all that. We can, so that's so good. So you'll you'll see a little bit of that. And then you know at the end, uh, the, you know the the call to action is about microservices, and we'll talk a, a bit about that. All right. So. When you know, the, the the topic of the session is enterprise applications, and when when, when when I'm talking about enterprise applications is not an ERP app or a you know SAP app. I'm talking about the applications that you developers and your enterprises develop every day to deliver whatever pro, you know services or products that your company does. So it's enterprise applications that are homegrown essentially, right? So. Uh, I've been around long enough to, you know, I haven't seen the, the real mainframe, but I've, you know, worked for Sun for many years, and it was, Sun was in the business of, you know, saying, hey, you know, mainframes are going to be dinosaurs. There'll never be another mainframe in the world, and there's still mainframes, right? So, but yeah, things move from mainframes to where your application was this big monolithic thing, and to, uh, you know, folks like Sun and HP and Apollo and all those guys came into this client server, where you could have distributed applications, and you didn't have to have it all stuck on one box. But, and then now in SOA became a thing, where service-oriented ar ar uh, architecture, where you have services that are distributed across many things, and you loosely couple them, so if something can change things. And what was interesting, one of the, the, the things we used to talk about with customers was, back in the Sun days, was the Sprint friends and family network. It was like this big thing about Sprint's Friends and family, like you could be able to change your phone uh, bill quickly, and it was all about the only reason they could do that is that they had implemented a, a SOA infrastructure so they could make pr pr changes to their process quickly and uh, do those things that makes customers come to you. And then now there's cloud. So in a lot of ways, people say, "Hey, cloud is the same old thing as client server, and it's the same old thing as microservices, is the same old thing as SOA," and it kind of is, but it's kind of not. And then who knows what's going to be next? But if you look back and look at all those things, one of the things that, that are common and have stayed the same is the lo location of the application. So when you have the location application, you're, you're stuck with a mainframe. It's, it's where it's at. Uh, in client server, you have to be stuck to one box. You could have multiple boxes doing things, but it's still stuck to wherever data center it's at. So uh, similarly, it, it, it was very rare to have a very distributed application. And in cloud, even today when we talk about cloud, we talk about applications living in one place or another. If they're on a private cloud or if they're on a public cloud, you know, do, do I move them? But you're really talking about a, as a uh, application as a thing living in a particular place. And that's not, um, not the way we should think about it in the future. So when we, and, uh, one of the overused terms of uh, cloud is hybrid. And if, uh, I thought it was an interesting exercise to go to dictionary.com and see what the real definition of hybrid is. We don't use that uh, definition at all in cloud, right? It, hybrid means I'm on pri uh, uh, private cloud and I'm moving to public cloud or vice versa. And there's, you know, almost anybody you talk to, the, the pictures kind of illustrate everybody has a different definition of hybrid, panda, penguin, uh, uh, electric car, but in cloud it really comes around to be about location. That's what the main point. If I'm, I'm on a public cloud, I want to move to a private cloud, but the application, the, the typically the entire application lives in one or the other. It's not a distributed thing. 
and we're going to talk about that some more too. So that's actually a good, uh, the, that top uh, definition is actually quite a good definition, and we're going to come back to that later. But all right, so why do people use hybrid? We talk a lot, uh, if you went to any of the cloud sessions in the inner cloud, we talked a lot about that because there's all just all sorts of options. You got private clouds, you got public clouds from other vendors, you got our public clouds that are the uh, distributed intercloud that's uh, federated and compatible across the globe. Um, and people use those for all sorts of reasons. Some of it would be uh, capacity uh, augmentation. And if, you, if, you're, if you're really into hybrid and, and the methodology for how you move a application from a private cloud to a public cloud, if you read up on Zynga, it's like a really good case study of, of how that methodology can work and how they used it and how they moved. You know, they had like a, a 80,000 node um, private cloud, it was the largest private cloud in the world. And then now their business has changed, so they've kind of moved a bunch of it back over to, to Amazon into a public cloud. But that's, a, many people get the, you know, when you move things to one place or the place or another, you usually get it wrong, but as is like a really good case study to explain how that process works. And of course, that, that little story I just told, it helps highlight the, the other reasons, cost efficiency, that, um, it was, it's, in some cases, it's cheaper to run your whole application in a private cloud. Some, and if you, you, in some cases, it's more cost efficient to move it in the public cloud for temporary stuff. Uh, so people do that. And then if you do any business in, the, in Europe, data location is really important, right? You got all these data sovereignty rules that I have to have my data in Germany or I have to have it in uh, Belgium or whatever. So that causes you to have to place your application in certain places because of that. And then security, your IT guys say, hey, you know, I can't let that application, because it has uh, sensitive information, I can't let it outside the firewall. So that dictates where the application lives. And until, you know, recently, location is really the main aspect of when you talk about applications and what they do and how they do it and where they live. And a lot of decisions are made just about the location, of the, the structure of the application. So, and, and, and kind of a history lesson on hybrid and what, how do we move things and how do we do things in multiple locations. And we still do this today, and we have a product that helps to do that, uh, InterCloud Fabric. But if you move in, uh, just whole, you know, take a VM, OS, everything, and move it somewhere else. And yeah, that's the, the forklift method, right? That's pretty, it can be ugly because there's all sorts of things that make it go wrong. You got your, and uh, you know, cloud frameworks, and we're talking about cloud frameworks, uh, VMware and Microsoft make it relatively easy because everything's the same. They use the same hypervisor, they say the same image type, they have the same, network model, same, you know, maybe they have an API or maybe they don't, but it's still the same. And that makes it easier. But then in this new world that I'm going to go to next, it gets a lot more messy. With the, you got open source becoming a thing, OpenStack. You know, one of my reasons I'm in the cloud group, I've spent time at Rackspace and, you know, helped productize their uh, compute OpenStack deployment and, and, and Adele as well. Uh, so those are the kind of clouds that I'm most familiar with, is uh, kind of these open source, uh, API-driven modern clouds I would describe. And then now, so when, when they came about, all that moving of VM became very complicated because you had a choice of hypervisor, you have a choice of network models, you have a choice of image uh, format, so it became a lot more difficult. But that's okay because we didn't use that technique so much anymore uh, because APIs, all these, you know, the, uh, OpenStack has an API, Amazon has an API, like, you know, Amazon, Google, Azure, um, EC2, uh, OpenStack, CloudStack, Eucalyptus when it was a thing, you know, had APIs that could, you could manage everything about the cloud and you didn't have to deal with the VM, you didn't have to move VMs, you could just, you know, create uh, whatever it was on there with these automation tools and that's where Chef popped up, Puppet popped up, Scalar and uh, RightScale came to be to manage these assets and deploy applications through an through a API interface. Open source becomes mainstream. You know, one of the guys in the last session was asking, how, did, uh, how, do you make, how does a developer make money uh, developing open source? Well, open source is mainstream now. Uh, uh, the 
if you're a Python developer, you can be a, a very well-paid OpenStack developer. And it, it's kind of depends if, you know, if you're an open, uh, open source contributor or developer, you need to pick the right project to be a part of because some are more valuable than others. But uh, uh, the HP, IBM, Cisco, Rackspace, you know, everybody has uh, adopted some open source project. OpenStack is a, you know, a good uh, example. And then with all that, with these uh, the API-driven capabilities and the tools that became available, DevOps becomes a thing. Being able to automate things, uh, you know, the, 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 the culture and the budgets kind of in startup lean uh, models kind of drove all those things to create this DevOps things where, you, uh, where people didn't have any money or they're laying off people in these big companies and you need to do much more with less people. So the only way you could do it was to automate things and that became DevOps, and now that's that's a main thing. There's a whole uh, 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 conferences about DevOps and how you do it, and that's and that bec that's become mainstream. So that's good, but you're still VM centric. I mean, it's about managing your VMs, your manage maybe your storage, but it's it, it, the application is kind of bound by that location thing still. So uh, the, the platform as a service has been around a while, but it's really gotten some traction lately. And it provides a lot of goodness about, you know, but it, it's still location centric, but it, it helps the developer and it helps the IT guy too. Um, but it has all these uh, capabilities inside the framework that make it really easy. You know, like OpenShift is really easy. You put a Git push in your application and you don't have to worry about working to put, putting a tarball and distributing it all to whatever, how many nodes you're gonna run. It just does that automatically. It has automatically auto scaling capabilities, health checks, restart, if it's just, those uh, uh, platform as a service frameworks really give you a lot of goodness in making it especially easy for developers to just code and deploy, and you don't got to you don't have to screw around with a Linux underneath or Windows or whatever. And you can deploy in all sorts of models. You know, like what I call a single silo, where you have this one deployment, and you have multiple deployments that are that, that are you know, you know they're individual silos, or you can have. Like when we, we deployed one at Dell, where it was, uh, had a main brain in, in, in one spot when we could, in, in the US, but we could have uh, nodes across the, across the globe um, managed by that one main brain, and you can, it's one big, big, uh, uh, you know, distributed model. But up until recently, and it's still kind of true if you live just in the PaaS framework, they're incompatible. So if you do an application in a Prenda, it doesn't, probably is not going to work properly and your tooling's not going to work properly in Cloud Foundry and OpenShift, but that's all changing because, now so I, 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 I'm going to, I saw a, a presentation yesterday here that was like uh, Samuel ja Jackson said, you know, say Docker one more time in, you know, I'm trying not to say Docker, but the, these, the containers are really important. It's going to, it's really changing the way you developers ought to start thinking about how in, to develop applications and how that location relationship works with that, because all that's going to, uh, it's going to, location is going to matter less in your containers, because one of the things that is described about platform as a service is if you create, if you adopt the platform as a service model and you develop an application from it, it really, uh, and it runs on Cloud Foundry, if you want to just, you know, do something with it, you need to make sure you go to another Cloud Foundry deployment, and uh, there's a few around. Uh, but in, in the, and the thing I mentioned to talk about platform as a service, the good part about platform as a service is it really is a kind of a hybrid in the way we talk about cloud today. An application, I want to move it somewhere else. I don't have to put the whole OS and the forklift model. I can just do just the application, and it's much better. But so containers give all sorts of options, and there's all sorts of uh, emerging and you know somewhat competing technologies with Ro uh, Docker and Rocket, uh, and today it's still kind of uh, you know, up in the air what's, what technology is exactly going to win. But it's pretty certain that containers are going to play a big part of the future of application development and deployment. Um, and you'll have much more choices of where to deploy that application because containers take away those uh, lock-ins that uh, say I was describing about Cloud Foundry. If I had to cr create an application in Cloud Foundry, it's probably not going to run on OpenShift or Imprenda. With containers, it has that uh, uh, 
a portability model. So I can create a container and it can run in anything that can run Docker, or if it can run uh, core OS or whatever. And I have all sorts of choices where I can still do VM based. So I can just, just uh, use a VM and put all the uh, you know, container, whatever decide, container mecha mechanism I choose to, and do it at the VM level. Um, or many, most of the mainstream OSs are building in Docker type of container support natively, Red Hat 7, Core OS, Ubuntu, uh, so you can just go straight there and have it managed as a container and not a VM. And you got the infrastructure for service vendors. OpenStax has a, a, a new project called Magnum that containers are a first class citizen, so you don't have to deal with VMs at all. You just deal with the containers, deploy it and management with those. And then pla platform as a service vendors, like OpenShift and uh, I'm not really sure about Apprentice Store, but I know OpenShift's going, uh, their 3.0 product that'll be out here in a few months, is uh, they re re rewrote it to be pretty much container-centric. So it, uh, everything they do is around containers. Cloud Foundry uses a different container uh, technology, but it's also going towards uh, really container-centric de deployments. So you have all sorts of choices now that you didn't have, and your application can be relatively portable because those choices support the same or very similar uh, models. And even, even Microsoft has, uh, you know, Microsoft's made a lot of changes since uh, Steve Ballmer left, and one of the changes is to be much more open, and they're going to support Docker uh, in, in their things. All right, so if you swerve into that, so that's where we're at, or at least where I think we're at. And we're back to, okay, what's the, the definition of uh, that, that hybrid? Well, this is the, 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 the idea we're talking about containers and microservices. I didn't really give a definition of microservices. I'm kind of assuming you kind of already know that or maybe seen these other sessions that have that. Um, but in that model, you have, you can, the, this idea of hybrid really becomes this com composite heterogeneous environment uh, you know, distributed across wherever because it's portable and you have lots of targets and location matters a whole lot less. So we have this incubation product that's moving from an incubation pro uh, project into a really fully managed product called Shipped that puts uh, pieces together all the components that's necessary to develop, manage, deploy, and you just do the whole life cycle of an application uh, that's around micro containerized microservices. So I don't know if you can see that, but when, when you get, uh, there, there's a couple, there'll be a couple of ways to con consume shipped. You can go to the, uh, there's a link at the end I'll show you. You can go, there's a, there'll be a, a shipped uh, web page. You can go use and play with a sandbox, but you'll also be to, able to download uh, pieces of it and run it yourself. And this is kind of what all you get. You get connections to GitHub. You get uh, all, the, all the components in the life cycle structure of an application with you know, the orchestration, the uh, continuous deployment, some continuous integration, uh, source control, all those pieces will be included and kind of pre-integrated so you can just begin using them. And, you know, we we'll throw in some Cisco technology here with a Spark so you don't have to use IRC channels to collaborate with it. Um, but uh, that was demonstrated uh, this week also. And so it'll provide the, the framework for you to begin deploying and developing in these microservices and deploying in them places. And the essential component structure is that you, you know, you, you'll, you'll, you'll get a uh, sandbox that'll be deployed to your local de desktop. You, you edit, you know, you do your development and then you deploy it up to the shipped um, structure of this display, the, all the, you know, drone and what, so forth, that it will, and it will uh, be able to go deploy it wherever. Like we got, the example is that uh, MetaCloud, you know, we changed the MetaCloud name to Cisco OpenStack um, Private Cloud, but, you know, we still call it MetaCloud, at least internally. And then the CIS is our OpenStack Public Cloud infrastructure, so you can deploy, in this is case, we're kind of, you know, highlighting the Cisco technologies that you can use to deploy these things, and those are compatible, all compatible OpenStack distributions. They can use the same tooling, the same API uh, structure, uh, to deploy it, to, to manage and uh, do the automation. And then, so at the end, you know, this is a part of the shipped uh, GUI that will be able to, s to visualize your deployments. And this kind of highlights this, you have microservices deployed everywhere or in, uh, across the globe. And 
you know, I took that a little bit farther. There's, when, you, when you talk about deploying your applications, you're not deploying uh, your application, like a, a microservice is a component of your application and you can choose the best location for that component and not have to be constrained like the old private cloud, public cloud, hybrid cloud. It just needs to go where it needs to go and it can be across the world and you use APIs to, to, um, to manage them and interact with them and they can be distributed and you don't have this idea of a application has to be in one place its components can be in various places serving their particular purpose uh, in a you know, loosely coupled way using the you know, REST, based, REST type APIs. So, if you want to learn more, there's the, the link, developer.cisco.com slash, I think slash ship will get you there too, but that gives you all the details. It's, it's, it's an emerging technology, an incubation product, project, it's becoming more of a fully managed project, a uh, product, and uh, you know, it doesn't solve world hunger, but it does, hopefully it will give you an idea to think about, think differently about developing your applications, starting to adopt uh, the microservice uh, applica architecture deployment mechanisms. And you think about location, you know, when, you, you, when people talk about, well, where's, where's it gonna be? Well, it could be anywhere, it could be everywhere. What's the best place? What's the best target? Can it be, does it need to be on a PaaS? Is it be, can it be on a, your guest OS? Could it be on a VM? Can it be just on uh, uh, OpenStack uh, container API? There's all the, the there's much more many more options coming that uh, allow you to make the right decision and not be stuck. When you're as the developer, your job is to do the the how. You know, project product managers are to kind of give you an idea of what to do of the what. Now you have a much more uh, expanded view of how to do it. Many more choices and. This is, you know, kind of highlights one of those, that uh, this microservices, containers, really opens up that, um, those options. So that's the end of my story. I think I'm almost out of time, but if you have any questions, I'd be glad to hear them. All right, well, thank you. Thank you, Ed.